Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Black Health and Wealth Show. I'm your host, Kevin Boyett, and today we have Dr. Aaron Tucker from Temple University. Good evening, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing well. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. It's a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, I think folks are going to be very impressed. After reading through your bio and resume and everything, I mm-hmm. had no clue you had done so much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've been very, very busy. So Yeah, um, just, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk today about education. Um, education is a big topic now, of course, with the confirmation hearings going on and everything. Education is huge. So what I want to talk about, you know, let's familiarize folks out here in the world with a little bit of your background. I know that you went to an HBCU. You've, you know, traveled around. You know, you've kind of seen both sides of the coin. You've gone to HBCU out, and, you know other university yeah. route um you traveled around the world um so share with folks what's going on with dr tucker yeah well uh thank you once again for having me um i the reason why i'll just kind of tell you a little bit of my journey is because uh, it relates a lot to education so you know a lot of times people just see their degrees but there's kind of a story behind you know why i ended up getting the degrees that i've gotten and what i've kind of used them for so um originally i'm from chicago illinois i'm officially a south sider which technically makes me a white Sox fan but um, after 108 years i definitely have no problem claiming the cubs <laughs> okay um, I, went to, I went to i decided to go to florida a m and uh, so I left Chicago, went to FAMU. Um, in my senior year of college, I decided that I didn't want to take a traditional corporate job. I wanted to follow my passion, whatever that meant. And I wanted to go into sports marketing, whatever that meant. And I decided to turn down the corporate jobs and go back to Chicago. And I ended up getting um, an internship with a, um, a sports agent there. And I was telling people, like my first job out of college was an internship. I made $18,000 that year. And it was definitely probably the best year of my life. Um, It was at that time that I decided, okay, I want to go back to grad school and go for sport management. So I went back to Florida, went to Florida State, and there I did two internships. I did one with RDV Sports, which is the Orlando Magic. And at the time, the the miracle was the new WNBA team. And then after that, I did an internship with the PGA Tour. And it was after those two times that I went, that I just, that I ended up getting like that real job (laughs) and uh, with the check and benefits. And um, that uh, took me to a really big sports company called General Motors R Works. And people were kind of like, what's so big about that you know, in sports? And it's like, well, I was the promotions manager for, the, for Cadillac and Buick. And so they were the official cars of the PGA Tour. And so I ended up doing that for four years in Atlanta. And then just through um, just life changes and things such as that, I ended up moving from Atlanta to Charlotte and I couldn't do the same thing. But within my network, because even though I was working, I still volunteered at sports events, you know, stayed kind of involved in events and things like that. Um, I ended up um, getting one of my one of the people in my network and I'll never forget her. Her name is Vanessa Gates. She was the vice president of HR for a company called Jillian's Entertainment which many people know Jillian's, most people know Dave and Buster's sort of now, it's kind of the same concept. And she uh, basically recruited me to come over and be a special events manager. And I was like, I don't know anything about restaurants. And she was like, no, you know, events, you know, sales, you know, people. And um, that brought me basically from like a corporate sort of sports environment um, with events to a kind of more social events, holiday parties, uh, et cetera. And we were right down the street from Lowe's Motor Speedway. So I ended up becoming a NASCAR fan pretty big because if there was any drivers that won that Sunday, I was up here calling their assistants like, don't you want to do a party? Um, And so I did that. And so while I was doing that, I knew I didn't want to be a special events manager um, in that role forever. Like I didn't see myself doing it for 10 years. So I just but I did like the fact of working in like the food side. I liked, uh, I, you know, learned companies like um, I learned about companies like Compass Group, Aramark, Sodexo. And there's these huge global corporations. And so. I decided to go and get my executive MBA from Winthrop University. And I did that because I wanted to continue working while I was going to school. Um, And so I pretty much, because I'm a planner period, I had my life pretty much figured out, right? But see, life doesn't work that way, right? Right, (laughs) yeah, you don't um, set of plans coming along. Exactly, exactly. Um, So what ended up happening was, was that kind of serendipity sort of happened. Um, There was a school named Johnson & Wales University that was opening up in, in, in Charlotte. 
and they're located, their main campus is in Providence, Rhode Island, um, but they were opening up a campus in Charlotte and they were known for their culinary and hospitality programs. I actually booked them for a, a recruiting event. And the uh, between meeting the uh, director of admissions, meeting the dean, um, they, you know, I was kind of really interested in wanting to maybe see what this classroom uh, environment was like as a teacher. And so they said, OK, why don't you come in and guest speak? And so, because they had this major called sports event entertainment management. So I basically went in and guest spoke for two classes. And I said, this is what I want to do. Like I just it was purely like. I wasn't really necessarily trying to pursue education in the same way. Right. Um, it's just that I really found that this was the area I wanted to be in. So um, I started as an adjunct. I was doing that. So I was doing that when going to school and working full time. It was kind of a blur. That year was sort of a blur. Um, at the time, Jillian's ended up uh, breaking the company. The company broke apart. And so not some of our locations got bought by other by independent like people, but nine locations and the one I was working at ended up getting bought by Dave and Busters. And so when you got, you know, your parents change up, a lot of things change as a result of it. Right. And I thought that that was a good time for me to exit stage left and change careers. And so when I went over and started working in uh, in uh, academia, I remember looking at my first check and going, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, uh, it makes for a good story now, but at the time right. I was like, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, just with faith was kind of like, you know, I know I can get somewhere with this. And so um, as I continued on, um, the uh, Bobcats, which I guess now are the Charlotte Hornets, they were originally Charlotte Hornets, then they became the Bobcats, and now there's Hornets, the Hornets right. again. They were building a, in a stadium down the street, um, which was in downtown um, uh, Charlotte, um, by the... Um, by the school. And so um, the vice president of guest services for the Bobcats was actually starting to look for somebody to do service education training, service educator training. And so I ended up like, you know, starting to do that. And it kind of worked out because it was like basically doing a lot of the uh, training for the individuals you see when you go into the, uh, go into the arena. And then as a result of that, um, I ended up starting a company. And so I did that. And then what happened was, I mean, I was doing that. And I said, you know, I think this is something that can build on. But what happened was I, in starting this process of a company, um, the uh, Charlotte Knights, which was a minor league baseball team, they were like, they wanted to get their service standards up. And so one of my students who happened to work at the Bobcats Arena actually recommended me. Uh, they said, oh, we have this, you know, one of my professors, you know, sort of does this. So I ended up doing a whole baseball season. You know, I ended up having both of those kind of clients-ish, um, you know, work, you know, doing it. And that really kind of cemented what I was doing in, in Charlotte. And so Charlotte was pretty good to me. I mean, there's a lot of other stories I can say. Um, but once again, life happens. And so what happened was um, the, uh, the university wanted more professors with PhDs. And so oh, I thought that this would be a good time to, maxim to really maximize my value in an academic environment was to go pursue it. So originally my plan was to go part time. I kind of had this idea of, OK, I can go part time and do it. And there was only two programs that had part time uh, PhDs and part time programs, PhD wise in hospitality, because that's what I wanted to do. And that was Oklahoma State and Iowa State. And so I looked at Oklahoma State and decided to apply there. There was originally there was supposed to be one arrangement set up. It didn't work out, so I had to go out there. And I don't know. I mean, I think after going out there for like a summer, because I went out there for a summer, it's hot, it was quiet. Um, you know, Oklahoma is a place, you know, you kind of think about initially going. Um, but I knew that I wanted to get this degree finished. It wasn't the same sort of like degree as kind of like how I deal with my MBA. Right. And so all of that stuff, I ended up you know, walking away, I ended up giving my company sort of over to another person, which I'll never do that again. Um, Cause there could have been a lot of equity and things like that. I could have like thought about, you know, continuously bringing in a check and I wasn't right. thinking of it because I didn't have that type of mentorship. mentorship. Um, but I ended up leaving that and going out to Oklahoma and that ended up opening up the world to me. I ended up uh, teaching in Singapore for two summers. Um, and then when I finished in 11, I took my first job at Boston University and Four years later, I came over here to Temple. And so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So you, you've you talked, to, you know, on your journey. One of the, you know, we talked about you traveling the world. So yeah. is traveling something that you think that is important for students? I mean, it sounds like, you know, your, your trip to Singapore 
and teaching mm -hmm. in Singapore. It happened a little bit later, but in terms of your students now, do you encourage them to travel sooner? Absolutely. I mean, I tell my students, I didn't leave this country until I was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and once I left, I actually went, it was during my MBA, we had the option of, in the summer of going, doing a, um, going two weeks to China. I mean, no, excuse me. First trip I went to, went two weeks to Europe. And okay. we did like a project as a result of that. And that was my first time out of the country. I was 30. So that opened, and that two week trip opened up like my eyes. I mean, just that time alone. And so when I finished, because MBA is only two years. So it just happened that the next year there was a trip. Cause Winthrop always did an international trip with his MBA students. Um, and they were going to China. And I was like, oh, that's, this would be my graduation gift. And so one of my <laughs> girls and I, we, just, we said, hey, do you have any more space? And they were like, yeah. So that was my second trip. And it was just like, I got addicted to the travel book. So I believe that travel is definitely the best form of education. And I highly encourage, I, I push my students to take advantage of study abroad. It's just something that wasn't as as an option. Like, I mean, it wasn't, nobody really talked about it even when I was in school, in college right. in the 90s. It just wasn't, you know, talked about as much. And now it is a require, I require students to that. I say, if you can just plan it out, go, because you'll realize that the world isn't against you. Right. Now, the other thing is, you know, on this journey, you talked about having your own company, being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. giving up the company to someone else. Mm -hmm. So those those entrepreneurial skills that you exhibited were those things that were taught at home, taught at school, kind of something that fell into your lap through this journey. Um, so, you know, talk about that a little bit, because I mean, like you've talked about, you, you've had a bunch of educational experiences yeah. and that in and of itself is an educational experience outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. But to decide to take that entrepreneurial leap, where mm -hmm. did that come from? Um, I think it definitely, it, it fell into my lap. Okay. Uh, to be completely honest with you. Uh, it, it's not that I, I mean, I was never opposed to it. I just didn't think I was that person. It's just that sometimes when people start knowing what you're good at, I think that, I think that we have a passion for things. And I think that a, a passion is cool, but sometimes it's okay to pursue something that you're good at. Because sometimes things that we're good at come real easy. Right. And we kind of go, there's no way people are going to pay us to do it. It's going to pay us to do it. Right. And so that's how the opportunity it really fell into my lap. I had I had a, a, one of my colleagues ask me if I had a business plan. I never had a business plan. I never wrote a business plan. It was just mm -hmm. like the client fell in my lap. And I think that I wish I would have had some sort of structure to my in an educational perspective, because I'm a very structured person, that I could have thought a little bit, well, a lot deeper about what I wanted to do with this company instead of going with the flow. So I do wish I sort of had that because I didn't have as much mentorship. I've had I've had people around me that have owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So I think I've been around a lot of entrepreneurs and I see what you have to really go through. Um, and so when I had this opportunity, these opportunities just sort of fell in my lap. I could have, there could have just been so many other things that I could have done, but I didn't have that mentorship. And I think it's important to still, we talk about mentorship in a, in the, in a corporate environment. We never talk about from an entrepreneurial perspective, because a lot of times we think that entrepreneurs would be so competitive. We wouldn't want to help out another entrepreneur when actually that's uh, that's actually a huge boss of it. So I wish I had that. Right. So <clears throat> sticking to that point. Mm hmm if you had to had it to go back and do over again, mm -hmm. okay, what, what types of things would you have done differently? Um, I would have definitely talked to, well, I wouldn't other have than, given up. Other than getting yourself a mentor. Oh yeah. Um, I would not have, well, I would have still gone to, gone to school. I would have mm -hmm. still done that, but I would have, I would have in, talked to more like, like people like uh, you know, lawyers. Um, I would have, you know, talked to other people who own their own businesses and kind of asked about things such as, creating equity uh, for, for the company, you know, really creating, um, a, you know, maybe an S corporation where I could have done maybe some, uh, you know, some you know, literally pieces of equity I could have maybe given to someone uh, to continue running the business. Um, I would have charged more mm -hmm. to my clients because I was giving them something. I didn't really know the value of what I was giving. Right. And uh, I just kind of compared it to what I was already kind of getting paid for and I could have should have researched a little bit more um, on how to on really how to charge and pay 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at that time we weren't doing as much with things like online and, and things like that, but I could have still stayed pretty much heavily involved. Right. Um, so I would not have given up my company that way. I would have still stayed involved in some way. Um, but it was also hard though, though, the young lady that I was working with, she was tough to work with. You know, I would have, mm-hmm. I should have found other people to maybe partner with. Now, when you talked about lawyers and other people that have businesses <laughs> and things like that, you know, basically what we're talking about is your network. Yeah. So what advice would you give to students, you know, involving building their network, creating their network, you know, even from high school to oh, yeah. present day? Um, yeah, it, it's it's network is everything. I mean, it's it's um, I mean, I had two clients and I, ne- I didn't go out and pursue them. I had. You know, I you know would have set up and 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 maybe make the money that I made. I, I should have put it more. I should have retained it and used it more within the company. Um, those things are just really important. And like literally, it was just because I was within this space that there was a need. And so, um, you, I think there is something to be said about having a plan or having some and being able to talk to other people that's your network is 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 everything i know you've heard a lot of things you know you know you know you know what is it it's not your network is what your net is neck is neck is worth something like that your your net your network equals your net worth (laughs) yeah exactly exactly and you know i feel that we spend a lot of time you know getting you know going out and networking with people but it's also important of you know who knows us because your reputation far exceeds people talking about you and you don't even know these people. Right. So that's part of your network too. So this concept of your reputation and your brand, now everybody uses the term brand, your personal brand, everybody talks about your online reputation. Those things at that time, even though this was the 2000s, probably 2005, seven, eight, um, it wasn't marketed the way it is now. So all of those things are part of your network is it is invaluable okay so that that leads me to you know a discussion that you and i had offline Mm -hmm. in terms of you know academic collateral Mm -hmm. so that would fall in which you know there were different categories that you talked about that falls into which category um culture cultural capital and social capital okay because that's really i mean you know, and talking about, you know, is, you know, is college worth it? Um, no, nah, man, what you want me to do? I want to sit here and say, no, nah, man, as a professor, no, nah, I'm going to get that. Come on, get we need out. it from the inside. Tell the students from the inside it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it. Um, the reality, um, it is worth it. Okay. Um, it's just that there's a couple things is, is, that has to be understood that nobody expected I think even the powers that be when universities even were forming that the number of people that would go get a college degree would be the numbers where they are now. I mean, the average every May on average, you have about 10,000 students at different points of their lives and careers graduating from some form of a university or it's college or whatever. And we don't have that those those jobs, you know, it, right. and it's been going on for 20, 25 years. And so as a result, it's not that the college isn't valuable. It's the fact of what you have to do within the college environment to really take advantage of it. You have to hustle in college. You've got to not just go to class and get the and get the grades, but you also have to do that. And then you have to you know, be leaders in your organizations. You've got to and that's part of your networking. Um, you've got to you know, if your faculty members ask you to do something or the dean's office asks you to do something, uh, do it. You know, they ask you to you know, take some high school students around because all of those things help build your unique identity. Um, if you've got 10,000 people kind of coming out with the same sort of level. So college now has to be like a four year interview. I mean, you're interviewing yourself for the world. And so when you're finished with it, what have you done that can that another that an organization can say, OK, I'm going to will it take I'm going to I'm going to be willing to take that chance on you. OK, so. Now, with that being said, at 18, you know, 17, 18 years old, are mm-hmm. you necessarily equipped to begin doing that? Every, you know, we have a lot of people that start college that don't finish. Yes. We have a, a lot of people, you know, that can't afford to go, that want to go. 
Yes. You know, so, you know, we got Bernie Sanders trying to get, you know, folks free college if they want it. But mm -hmm. students also shouldn't come out with a mortgage on their back. And so mm -hmm. you've had a lot of academic training. Is there something that you can suggest to navigate those financial waters? Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, the concept of, of college and pain. I think that, first of all, uh, I think that there's this romanticized view of what college should be. Okay. And the reality is that there is nothing wrong with uh, going a different path. There's nothing wrong with taking gap years and going and working um, and then going to a, a college. There's nothing wrong with um, community college. Um, and that's a little, that's more doable. As a matter of fact, some of my community college graduates are some of the most focused professional students that I've had um, because they have completed something in one spot space and they're finishing another space. So they're coming in already geared. No, at 17, 18, you, especially now, you probably don't know what you want to do. I mean, I, you know, but that also goes into the argument that college was never designed for your career. College was designed for you to learn the classics and to think critically and the Socratic method and all that. Universities became career centers um, and the popularity of that. Now, there's a lot of argument as to whether that's good or bad, but the reality is that's what happened. And mix that in with the price of college. Yes, I can understand. Like, I can understand why students going to come out of a program and they want to at least make $40,000 or $50,000. Like to somebody like myself, that's like, I would say you're, you're kidding me. Right. But the reality is that when you are 80,000 in debt or 90,000 or hundred or 200,000 in debt, it's not like that. It's not far fetched, you know, right. for them to at least want 50. I mean, it's, there's, you know, nothing, nothing with that. But once again, our corporations and, and just our country as a whole did not keep up with this group. So my aunt, my story too, I just had some students I talked to during my office hours today. You're going to have to start going to do two things. One, you're going to have to create your own job. So you can still, of course, go to school and, you know, strive to work. Uh, but you also want to create your own. There's plenty of stories of students, of people who have companies that started their companies out of their dorm rooms. Right. Um, so you, but you want to start creating your own job and you also want to be open to go work internationally because it might either your opportunities might not necessarily be here uh, the way that you want it to come right now do you think that that international experience would give them let's just say they wanted to come back to the states would mm -hmm. give them possibly a leg up on someone absolutely and there's actually research that really has uh, has shown that mm -hmm. um with that so yeah i mean it definitely makes you more marketable i mean it's not like you're gonna leave the country and you, you give up your citizenship or you know, anything right. like that. Right. Um, I think that though, even as, as and especially students of color, they're, we're still the smallest group that goes internationally. Uh, and that's for a variety of reasons. One, we don't prepare for it financially. Uh, we don't think about our GPAs because you have to have a certain GPA to, to, to go. Um, and so by the time we sort of even think about it many times, we're, it's our junior year, and we're kind of behind the eight ball. You should have been thinking of that even when you were in high school. Okay. So, um, you know, going into that. So like I said, like this college has almost become like a four year interview. And that's why I'm so encouraging the students to at least go and try it. And even if you don't necessarily like it, you've experienced and right. you, see, you get the chance to just see that things are just not one way. Right. Now, there are circumstances where students either bypass the four-year university all together you know, like when they leave high school because mm -hmm. there's a lot of high schools now that are offering these dual programs where students will come out with the associate's degree yep. along with their high school diploma Absolutely. so for those students you know should they go the four-year you know transfer that that aa to a four-year school or is it a possibility that they can take that and go into a master's program um, now, depending on kind of what the uh, what the programs um, ask for, what happens is is that at, there are some schools that will take into consideration what's called your your you know your life experience. So if you are score a certain uh, number on your GMAT or your GRE or in uh, you know so for example, I, I do know of a student that did not get a bachelor's degree. Um, but he worked now he didn't work a few years. I mean, he worked, he was in the industry for like 20 years, okay. but he got, she reached the level um, of, of almost a vice president. I mean, he was pretty much almost at that, that space. 
and um, he scored so high on the GMAT, they took his life experience into consideration and still admitted him into the master's program. Mm -hmm. So there are schools that would do that, but they're not going to advertise that. What you have to do is you have to go and set up, look at the schools that you want and go in and talk to, not the admissions people, because in the master's level is different. You go and talk to whoever's like the program director. And they're the okay. ones that are able to do that. And though, and you know, it might not necessarily be at a, you know, you know, an Ivy League sort of avenue, but it it's a possibility to do that. Right. So I mean, whether it's Ivy League or not, if you're 20 years old and you've got a master's degree, that's rather impressive. Absolutely. And remember, you know, you know, I mean, this whole education. I mean, you know, I, I you can get your high school diploma online. That's true. I mean, you can. I mean, you can. I, you know, in talking to admissions uh, directors and admissions counselors and things such as that. I mean, there are students who are applying to schools now. I mean, they have written movie scripts. They have, you know, um, YouTube channels. They have. I mean, it's not like it's just kind of just you know all fly by night. Right. Um, these are they. Have, they have done. You know, they've scored high enough. They've done a lot of different things. So. It's how you really want to structure it. And like I said, it doesn't have to look like, you know, cake parties and, you know, all of that stuff. You College can be almost tailored to what you what you really want. OK, so how do you determine that path? I mean, we, we talked about your journey and you had plans and those plans, you know, got diverted in other directions. How do you, you know, when you talk to your students and they're trying to figure out that path, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, what do you suggest to them? Well, I mean, in, in my student case, I mean, there's always about, there's, I always take them through the same things, you know, where are you from? Why did you pick this school? Why did you pick this major? You know, what interests you? I kind of do almost one on, such a one-on-one -on -one session because listening to what they want to do, what they have done and the path that they've done, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of things. I'm seeing the level of risk. I'm seeing whether they're even open to, you know, there's a lot of students don't even want to leave their home state. Right. You know, and that's going to be tough when, you know, we're talking about your career and finding out, you know, kind of what you want to do. Um, for example, like students, for example, who, who study sports management. So I teach a sport and society class to so say you want to go into sport is a huge thing. So, you know, a lot of them don't know specifically what they want to do. And so, you know, I kind of give them the information of what they need to do to research it. If you want to work in a pros, there's kind of there's not really a certain path. You have to go with where where's like the, in, the, the trend is. So I kind of tell them about that. On a, co on a college level, it's a little bit more structured. Um, so it just sort of depends on what opening your mind that you don't necessarily have to be at a D1 program. There's plenty of D2 and D3 schools even um, right. that are doing that are looking for qualified people like you. So it's kind of this sort of, you know, it's, it's and what I do is, is that I make them go and do the research and then circle back to me in three weeks. And that's what I would have to say, even just to your li listeners, you know, it's just kind of, you're gonna have to get out on this, on, you know, this computer, get off, you know, as we talk, get off of the social Instagram and really get on and, and look and start just asking, you know, these questions. And if you start that, that path and research, then you're able to maybe start looking at, oh, I think I'm really interested in this. Let me try that. Okay. so. You've, you've done the, the HBCU route. Yeah. You've, you've done the other university route. Mm -hmm. Is there a benefit to going to HBCU? Um, are there things that you got there that were transferable to any university that you've, you know, mm -hmm. either attended or worked at? Yeah. Um, what types of benefits do you think that you received? Um, the benefits that I receive is, is really going, I mean, it, it was going to HBCU a benefit for me. Absolutely. Um, uh, it allowed me to be around, it allowed me to learn a lot more about myself. I was around, uh, professors, not all professors, but majority of my fest professors that, that, that looks like me, but had very different backgrounds. And I learned basically all of the misconceptions that sometimes people have about HBCUs. First of all, most people think HBCUs, the student body all thinks alike. That's not true. I've met the most diverse. I met black Republicans. I met students from the Caribbean. I met students, I met a, you know, we had a student, I met somebody from Portland, Oregon. Like I just, you know, even growing up in Chicago, you know, you don't think about Toronto, Canada. Um, it's so much more diverse. 
And I think that a lot of times we get so caught up in that. And the other avenue is that an A at an HBCU is equivalent to an A anywhere. And so once my friends who wanted to go to grad schools and go to the Ivy Leagues or go where, or you know, the top 50s or whatever, did not have a problem because they understood they had a level of confidence. I had a level of confidence. I kind of felt like I could, you know, do anything. When right. you've graduated and finished out of an HBCU, um, I would not change it. Um, every school though is different and has its own culture, mm -hmm. but I would not, it is, has been absolutely invaluable for me. And so, you know, I think, I mean, just even misconceptions, like you're not going to get a job coming out of HBCU. That's like the furthest thing right. from the truth. Uh, like we, we, you know, we paranoid ourselves a lot of times into this and it's, it's just not the case. And so, um, and I, and one of my teaching experiences was at a top 50 school. So they didn't hold, they didn't hold me going to an HBCU against me. You right. know, so I had no, I was a professor at a top 50 school. So, and can go back into that world if I wanted to. So. You know, absolutely, it was a, it was a benefit. Okay, so what are the plans for Dr. Tucker in the future? Where where are we going from here? <laughs> <laughs> what do I want to be when I grow up? Right. <laughs> um, you know, I've been lollygagging back around and looking at this entrepreneurial um, avenue again. So I'm finding a space right now. Um, so I've been teaching events management and hospitality, a variety of different courses. But in the events management world, there's such a big, such a big sector that I'm finding that there's a uh, there's a gap right now in understanding the multicultural meetings market here in the U.S. And uh, there's a need to not just teach it, but to also inform people of the value of these markets. So um, I'm trying to write an ebook right now. I guess I'm about 80% of the way there um, in order to try to get that out, um, start a, com a community of of knowledge and learning um, for people to see. I want to do webinars and maybe even a conference and you know those avenues. So um, even though it's not necessarily in academia, we don't have to call it entrepreneurial. We call it really service to the profession, a subject matter experts. So I kind of really want to develop my subject matter expert uh, title within the space. Okay, so you're basically it sounds to me like you're kind of creating your own um, your own niche out there. You, absolutely you're kind of carving out your own little spot just in my own little spot absolutely right absolutely. But, you're, but by the same token with your book you're willing to help others to do the same so there's Absol like yeah. we were talking about before you know folks worried about competition um it doesn't appear that's something you're worried about you're more into helping others um yeah i mean i want to make money too uh, I but uh... you gotta eat <laughs> <laughs> you gotta eat. <laughs> but um and i think there's nothing wrong with that right um <laughs> but yeah no it's not a, it's not about competition because i because i'm i'm coming from my authentic journey right. i'm coming from a space that i mean yeah i mean there's people that teach event management all the time but they cannot teach it the way that i can they haven't experienced it the way that i've experienced it and so and there are people throughout the globe that would that are willing to like want to you know listen and pay for it and learn about it now, so um yeah that's i what, don't i don't i don't it doesn't matter about the competition yeah right so you talked about the the oh i just lost my train of thought <laughs> it's, just, it's all good the brain just froze up on me when we were talking about the um online stuff Mm -hmm. and, and teaching online and people not teaching as you teach mm -hmm. that to me i mean it talks it sounds like you have individuals who i mean it's just like like you said being online you have individuals there or certain individuals that you may listen to online or read their books or things like that and other folks that you don't they just don't appeal to you um mm -hmm. i personally i think you're gonna have a great appeal um mm -hmm. to, a, to a large number of people do and you talked about having this conference is it something that you're planning in the near future mm -hmm. you know two three four five years from now mm -hmm. um is it or is it something where you're looking to i guess start from a, a speaking standpoint before you try to hold your own thing well i definitely i'm uh working uh just through um, uh, just conferences and being involved in things, I'm going to start working with someone to get speaking engagements. 
mm-hmm. started. So I think that's something that I, I think I always want to end up doing, uh, that I want to do just continuously. But no, I actually would like to take this conference and align it to a, a few of the conferences that already exist. So for example, okay. like most people don't know that there's an organization called NAPHood. I'm kind of like, what's that? Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, never heard of that one. Never heard of that one, right? So it's the National Association of Black Hotel Owners and Operators. And they have a conference and they do, um, you know, this is where all of the, like, you know, people, you know, people don't know that there's actually people that, that are doing this. And they attract, of course, the Asian uh, hotel market, uh, the, uh, the Latino hotel market. So um, they have a conference that they do already. And then what so during their summer conference, what they do is they have a, there's a side conference on multicultural tourism. Um, and so I would like to either partner with one of those groups and grow that, you know, what I'm doing with what we're doing because it all aligns and keep growing from there. I don't, I mean, unless there's just some philosophical differences where mm-hmm. we, I would have to go my own way, which is fine. Right. Um, why not collaborate and continue on and grow with something that's already there? Because it definitely has not like, there's definitely like, it's not like it's penetrated the market so that everybody knows about it and is doing right. it. It's, it's still such a small niche. Right. It's, so it's, it's yeah. It's like I mean, you're trying to come out with a new computer operating system and you're trying to compete with Apple and Microsoft. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So, um, is there anything else that you want to share with the viewers, the listeners, before we get out of here? Well, I mean, I think that kind of in sort of wrapping up, I think that um, uh, uh, it's kind of probably three areas. One, I believe when we talk about passion, uh, that you know, I, I have a little—I call it a Tucker's equation where passion plus performance equals a profession and passion minus performance equals a hobby. So I think that it's okay to start from what your passion is, but if you don't have the performance to back it up, you don't always expect that people are gonna end up paying you then for it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to show some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of performance and, and value for people to then turn around and invest in you. So that's kind of one thing. Two, I think that in understanding um, economic capitalism, um, that the reason why we talk about the intellectual capital and the social capital is because at the end of the day, you know, the the, the song was first you get the money, then you get the power. Um, No, you get the power. You need that power equally as important as that money because the one thing that Game of Thrones is like was one of these shows that like I was not on a hike back wagon about. Um, I tried to watch it um, after like the second episode. I'm like, why am I doing this? I don't know, you know, these people. It was raunchy. Um, <laughs> I didn't get all the characters. Um, and last summer, I decided I got bullied into watching it again, and I watched all six seasons in like a six to seven week period. <laughs> and I understood this concept of what people are willing to do to get it, get power what people are willing to do to hold on to it, what people are willing to do to take it from others. And that is still how it is done technically today. There's, you know, there's a couple, there's a character that's become one of the famous characters on the show who started off with absolutely nothing. She was, uh, you know, pretty much sold into marriage. She was sold into these things. And then she ends up uh, because of things that had happened to her, she was just like, I'm about to take this power. And so, she takes it, you know, she goes in with nothing. And I'm saying that because a lot of times we sometimes like I got I had an opportunity, you know, um, with a business and I didn't have that intellectual capital on the business side, um, nor the social network to really be able to keep it going. So I would kind of do and like what's what I'm kind of doing now is kind of like, why would I not want to if I'm going to get make money, I want somebody else to make money along with me, but we can collaborate with it. Right. And continue on and sort of build a, it doesn't have to be with everybody, but somebody that I might find, you know, or a group of people. Um, I noticed that I noticed that even in economic kept in economics and with um, family or groups, you know, the, the family, the, you know, the, you know, one family might use like the same lawyers, the same accountants, the same, you know, like hairstylists, the same real estate people Like they use all the same people. That's a very powerful network. Right. right? So when their kids do get in trouble they have a network built already that can get them out right we don't have that no so <laughs> no no you, and you can't be you know running around talking about f the police and <laughs> then when your kid gets in trouble you know you're looking for help 
Yeah, yeah. So I would, I would, there, there's something to be said about that intellectual capital, that power, the understanding of power to go along with that, uh, with going along with what you're also trying to do. And um, lastly, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, college, you know, there's, it's still value. There's still value with it. Um, there's multiple ways you can go about doing it, right? Bernie Sanders did talk about free college, but Bernie Sanders also comes up during the time in which the state of California actually provides free college for its residents. Mm -hmm. This was during the Brown, Governor Brown's administration. This was something that was actually a very realistic thing. And then when Governor Reagan ended up coming in, he just shut all that down. But that right. was actually part of the system. Um, when I lived in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts passed affordable health care through Governor Rick Mitt Romney in 2007. It, it took four years to get the system right. But by the time I moved there in 2011, 98% of the people are covered. Okay. So it's not that these things can't work. It's just the fact that we're not, you know, people have very short term memories, you know, um, right. that's why the intellectual capital is so important to go along with this because I mean, I can sit and have a conversation with somebody and people, y'all remember going to Howard for the first time in 1985 and we checked into the Howard Inn, you know, Howard mm. had a hotel. Yes. So, <laughs> You know, and now they don't. And so it's not that we haven't had it. We've lost something in the process. And I think that the knowledge base is important. So those are the things that kind of leave with. Well, I want to thank you again. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you put out some very valuable information. I like that, you know, um, and I'm going to have to go back and listen to this and, and jot this down, <laughs> you know, about the performance and the hobby. And oh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Passion minus performance equals a hobby. That's what it was. Passion. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, so thank you again. Um, continue doing what you do. Um, it looks like you got some major things happening on the horizon. And um, and anybody, um, the best way they can uh, tweet me, um, follow my Twitter account. I do a still. I do a lot in the subject matter expert um, category when it comes to events. They can tweet me at Aaron Tucker. Or follow me on um, on Twitter at, at Aaron E R I N N Tucker. Um, and I'm probably that's probably been one of the best mediums for me to meet people all over, all over the globe. Hey, do what you do, lady. Do what you do. I'm proud right. of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. You too. All right.